Alright everybody, welcome back to another video. Have you ever wanted to combine the classic, crispy, clean character of certain German lagers with the aggressive punch and citrusness and pininess of New World American hops like you would find in a, in a good West Coast IPA? Well, watch on and I'm going to show you a method that I think is going to produce a pretty good IPL, which should be that perfect marriage between those two styles. So before we get started, I just want to say, if you're new here, welcome. Uh, this channel is all about creating grain-to-glass videos where I basically develop a recipe, brew the beer, and then actually taste the beer and critique it all in one video. So you get to see what kinds of decisions I made early on in the brewing process impacted the beer at the very end of the brewing process. All in one video. And just in case you're curious, there is a recipe in every single video's description box if you happen to see one that you like. All right, so IPLs are not an official style, by the way, um, but it is definitely a very doable beer, uh, and the very the gist of it is you take an American IPA recipe and you ferment it with lager yeast. Um, and in a perfect world, you're going to get a scenario where you have a crispy, clean fermentation character as you would get from lager yeasts, and a very bright and uh, clean hop character as well. And the idea is that the cleanliness of the lager fermentation allows the hops to shine in an almost brighter way than you would get with ales. Um, and to some extent that's true, but at the same time it's rather tricky because lagers do provide their own certain unique flavor characteristics which may or may not be welcome in uh, hop forward beers. I think IPLs kind of caught on pretty well uh, a couple of years ago, five or six years ago, but um, they kind of died down in popularity pretty quickly after that because New England IPAs started popping up and those are just immensely more popular. They're a lot less bitter, easier to drink, you know the gist. Um, but an IPL, I think, is still a style that's worth visiting and I think it can be a lot of fun. So there is a beer here in the New England area that is very famous, very good, and is probably, I would say, your quintessential example of an IPL, and that is Jack's Abbey Hoponius Union uh, IPL. I know many of you guys are from New England, so I'm sure you've had this beer before and know just how good it is. Well, that is sort of what I'm basing this recipe on. It's not an outright clone because I'm using slightly different hops, slightly different malts, and a slightly different yeast. Um, and probably a slightly different fermentation method as well. But um, overall though, the hopping regimen will be the same and the proportion of ingredients is gonna be roughly the same. I, I think an IPL should really have a good clean malt backbone. Nothing too aggressive, but definitely something that'll stand up against the hops and especially provide something interesting uh, in addition to just hop character. So in this recipe, there's a couple specialty malts that hopefully will not only lend a golden amber color, but also a pretty round um, and interesting complex malt profile. At the end of this, I'm really hoping for a clean and crispy beer. Uh, hopefully from that lager fermentation, we're able to get that. And then in addition, we'll have a, a decently complex malt profile, but that's just, just enough to be soft, round, and interesting. Uh, hopefully a nice, clear, light, amber, dark gold color. And of course, to top it all off, a tremendous amount of citrusy and a little bit of resiny character in there coming through, I hope, brightly. Uh, that is the intention here. Jack's Abbey's clone recipe calls for Citra and Centennial in addition to Magnum as a bittering addition. So I'm keeping the Magnum and the Centennial, but I think Citra is a little overused. And I've been wanting to play with Idaho 7 for a while, so I picked up some Idaho 7. And, and while it may not be a super similar hop to uh, Citra, I think it still will achieve the character that we're looking for in this beer. So I am looking forward to using it. Another thing that we're going to be doing uh, is doing pressure fermentation. I did this with my Oktoberfest and it just worked really, really well. Uh, the advantages of pressure fermentation are that you can essentially take a yeast that is not meant to be fermented super warm and ferment it super warm. Uh, by applying outside pressure to the fermentation, you in effect are actually able to suppress all of the nasty fusel alcohols, off flavors, and just generally undesirable yeast esters that you might get from fermenting warm. So this allows us to use a lager yeast at room temperature. The benefits to this are faster fermentation and cleaner fermentation. I will be using a lager yeast that is actually notorious for fermenting super clean at high temperatures even without pressure fermentation, but that is kind of as a catch-all in case it doesn't quite work the way I want it to. However, there are plenty of accounts out there on the internet of people using pressure fermentation over different lager yeasts and having great results. The other benefit to pressure fermentation that's going to impact this beer specifically is 
Uh, well, it's actually twofold. Number one, the added pressure keeps oxygen out of the fermenter, which, as we all know, oxygen is detrimental to uh, the brightness and character of hops. Beers with high hop contents will age very quickly if they have been exposed to oxygen and can turn bad colors and it also will just generally mute the hop character and uh, it just makes the beer taste pretty bad. However, in a pressurized fermentation situation, there's no chance of oxygen getting in there because there's always positive pressure, even after the fermentation has completed. And the other benefit of this is that it's also going to keep all of those volatile hop aromas, especially from when we dry hop, uh, just locked into the beer. And they're not going to express an off gas as the fermentation continues. So if all goes correct, we should probably see some sort of increase in hop character um, compared to beers that I have not pressure fermented. And basically, in a nutshell, uh, what I am doing is using something called a Firmzilla, which is a highly affordable, strong plastic, pressure-capable fermenter, uh, and it costs about $120. And that is a hell of a lot of a bargain compared to some stainless steel competitors. So I do, uh, I have used it for several brews so far, and it's been fantastic. Uh, it holds pressure very well, and it does the job um, in a clean way. So long as you're diligent about making sure you don't put your sanitizer in before diluting it and making sure you're not using super hot water. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the Firmzilla is an extremely accessible piece of equipment for people and I do highly recommend using it if you want to try pressure fermentation. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get into the recipe. So we are using uh, 11 pounds of two row as a base malt. You're going to have uh, one and three quarter pounds of Vienna malt, one pound of Cara Vienne, and then half a pound of flaked wheat, which is going to really hopefully help our head retention um, and keep a good level of fluffiness in the head. For hops, I am bittering with a half ounce addition of Magnum at 60 minutes, and then we're not doing anything until about 10 minutes are left in the boil, where I will add one ounce of Centennial. Uh, so once we end the boil after 60 minutes, I'm going to cool it off only to about 180 degrees where we will add a Whirlpool addition. So I'll be Whirlpooling two ounces of Centennial and two ounces of Idaho 7 uh, for about 20 minutes at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we will cool down the rest of the way, uh, we'll pitch our yeast, and we will dry hop after fermentation completes. I'm not going for a biotransformation dry hop here because this is sort of still in a West Coast style. Um, so we're not going to go for any super hazy boys here, even though it might be sort of hazy because of the polyphenols and the hops anyway. Um, but over time that actually may drop out. Uh, however, for our dry hop, post fermentation we'll be dry hopping with 2 ounces of Centennial and 2 ounces of Idaho 7 for 3 to 5 days, nothing too long. Um, and then we should be able to package. We're going to mash this at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for about 90 minutes um, or until conversion is completed. And then lastly for the water profile, um, I will mention I'm using my tap water and then building a water profile off of that. So it is rather minerally. Uh, I am aware of that and it does kind of impact some of my beers. However, it hasn't really been that bad uh, outside of dark beers. So what we're doing is 58 parts per million of calcium, 24 parts per million of magnesium, 69 parts per million of sodium, 201 parts per million of sulfate, 107 parts per million of chloride, and 36 parts per million of bicarbonate. And to achieve that, I added 9 grams of gypsum and 8 grams of epsom. So, yeah, I do have a pretty high magnesium count. It's probably going to make things a bit bitter. Uh, I understand that. But I needed to do that in order to get my sulfates up higher than my chlorides to roughly a 2 to 1 ratio, which enables us to have brighter hop character and uh, kind of helps... Uh, basically make the hops shine a little bit. Um, now, if you're making this with your own water, I just suggest doing your own water profile, but you can use that as a reference, and also you can see how my water profile may or may not impact the flavor down the road for this beer. So anyway, everything is all uh, up to temp. I've drawn off some sparge water, and uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and mash in. Okay, so I use this sort of uh, do-it-yourself recirculating system that I made about a year ago. Um, all it does is keep my mash at a consistent temperature. I want to stress to you that this system is not necessary to brew this type of beer. You'll do fine if you have a well-insulated cooler, um, or if you're doing the classic brew in a bag type of thing, you're still going to make fine beer. Um, this is just something that I implemented a while ago that helps me make it more consistently. Okay, so uh, at this point the mash is completed. I uh, did about a 90 minute mash and uh, that seems to have done the trick. 
So what I will typically do is, uh, since I have a two vessel system here, I will drain my wort from the mash tun into this kettle here. The capacity of this is about eight gallons. Um, and then I will typically need a sparge to top this off. So I have sparge water over here, which is heating up. And I will go ahead and sparge with that. And then we'll uh, collect the remainder of the wort in here until we top up the kettle to eight gallons. Once that has reached the top, I remove the bag and all the other grain and stuff out of this mash tun and I turn it into a boil kettle. And then we pump the wort from this kettle into this kettle here and start the boil. And now for the sake of the length of the video, I'm just not going to show that on video. So I'll catch up to you uh, when we're ready for the boil. Okay, so this is our pre-boil gravity sample and it's about 12 bricks right on the money. So uh, that indicates a pre-boil gravity of 1047, which is actually uh, significantly higher than my estimated one um, of 1041. So that's interesting, but um, I may have forgotten to put the mash profile in Beersmith correctly, so that's probably why. Um, either way, not a bad thing. It's okay for this one to be a little bit strong. Okay, so we got a pretty good rolling boil going here. So uh, we just hit the top of it. It's time for us to add our bittering hop addition, which is this half an ounce of Magnum at 60 minutes. So after that, uh, we're gonna wait around for uh, for 50 minutes, five zero minutes, until the 10 minute mark, and then we'll do some more things. Okay, so we are now 10 minutes from the end of the boil, so we're gonna start throwing some stuff in. First of all, I wanna throw in uh, this, which is a mixture of yeast nutrient and a whirl flock tablet, which I've brushed up. Uh, this is both gonna help aid in the fermentation quality as well as uh, aid in clarifying the beer at the end of this because we do want an actual clear beer. The other thing I'm gonna throw in at 10 minutes is my one ounce of Centennial, uh, which is gonna go in now. All right, so the other thing we're gonna do around 10 minutes is make sure that we sanitize the inside of whatever chilling system we're using. So in my case, I use a plate chiller, but you might use an immersion chiller or a counterflow chiller. Uh, whatever you use though, around 10 minutes, it's always a good idea to recirculate that boiling wort through the chiller or around the chiller. Uh, just to sanitize the inside the outside whatever parts touching your beer um, that is just going to help kind of make sure everything is sanitary but it's not going to clean your chiller for you just make sure that if you do incorporate this step that your chiller is already clean to begin with don't have chunks of mold floating around in your beer that's just gross okay so we have now completed the boil so it's time to turn off all of the heat sources and now we are going to start the chilling process so we are going to chill this until the average temperature in the kettle is around 170 degrees, actually more like 180 degrees, um, because it's gonna fall over time. And then we're gonna start our whirlpool. So um, shouldn't take very long, but uh, just wanna keep an eye on the kettle temperature, not the output work temperature, because once that recirculates back into the kettle, uh, it's gonna get heated back up again a little bit. So we wanna start this pretty much at 180 and then let it pass through that region of 180 to 160. All right, so at this point, we have reached 180 degrees in the kettle. And now we're gonna go ahead and add our Whirlpool addition here, which is the two ounces of Idaho 7 and two ounces of Centennial. So we'll put that in the hop spider. And I turned up the uh, intensity of the recirc, so we're gonna be able to ensure that the wort gets really good exposure to uh, the entire um, amount of hops that I threw in there. So we'll hold this for about 20 minutes. All right, so now we're gonna talk about how we're gonna ferment this beer. Um, so like I mentioned, it is gonna be under pressure. Uh, so what we're gonna probably do is add uh, about the same pressure schedule that I added to my uh, Oktoberfest video. So there I kind of explained more detail how to set up a pressure fermenter. So I'm just gonna link that here in the corner if you don't know how to do that already. Uh, doesn't take very much work, so don't worry about that. Um, but anyway, we're gonna ferment this under about five PSI of pressure uh, at the very beginning. And then we're just gonna ramp it up to about 15 PSI over the course of the entire fermentation, which with the W3470 yeast is honestly only gonna be probably four or five days. So once fermentation has completed, I'm gonna go ahead and start dry hopping. So we have two ounces of Idaho 7 and two ounces of Centennial uh, that we're gonna dry hop with uh, as soon as I can see that the crossing has fallen and fermentation is kind of ending. Uh, so we'll do that for about three or five days and then at that point I'll pull the dry hops out and we will package. So we're going to ferment this uh, with a W3470 yeast which um, honestly at a higher temperature uh, than usual. So W3470 um, if you're treating it like a lager you would typically ferment it at about 40 to 50 degrees but uh, in our case 
since we have the pressure fermenter, uh, we're gonna take it all the way up to about room temperature for pretty much the, the entire fermentation. Um, <laughs> this is gonna make it very fast, uh, and it's also because of that pressure fermentation gonna keep it clean, although there's definitely plenty of evidence out there saying that W3470 is as clean as an ale yeast at uh, room temperature. So do, with your, do what you will with that information. All right, so we are just about finished with our 20 minute whirlpool. Looks like things went pretty well. It dropped from about 170 to 160. Um, so pretty good range for a whirlpool. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and start finishing off the chilling process now. And um, I'll catch you when we transfer it to the fermenter. Everything is cooled down now and it's time to start transferring over into the fermenter. When I transfer over, I will typically splash the beer into the fermenter um, just to encourage the introduction of oxygen into the beer. And what that is gonna do is enable your yeast to have enough oxygen in order to be healthy and grow. Uh, so ideally you have a couple inches of foam on the surface of your beer by the time uh, you're finished transferring over. So hopefully, as you can see now, um, I've set up my keg with a spunding valve, and I've set that to about 5 PSI. As the uh, fermentation goes along, though, you may be able to increase the pressure, and if you have a vessel like this one, you can use it as a unit tank. So you can actually increase the pressure and uh, have the beer carbonate itself as it finishes fermentation. But I'm probably not going to do that in this case. Either way, um, I'll show you guys a quick original gravity clip, and then I will catch you guys with the final gravity. Okay, so this is our original gravity, and it's about 14 bricks, which translates to about 1056 for an OG. That is only two points higher than our expected OG, so pretty good overall. All right, so our final gravity sample is here. Fermentation was ultra quick, as is typical, and uh, with using the 3470 at room temperature. And it looks like we have a final gravity of about 1008. Uh, so that puts us at about 6.2, 6.3% ABV. All right, so we've completed fermentation now, and it was really quick, um, which is to be expected when you ferment this way. Uh, so the W3470 yeast will always rip through fermentation in like two to three days when you are uh, cranking it at high heat under pressure or without pressure even. And that is exactly what happened. I mean, we literally had final gravity two days after I pitched the yeast. It's probably a good thing that I did the West Coast style post-fermentation dry hop uh, instead of the middle of fermentation uh, biotransformation style dry hop because there was literally like no time for the yeast to interact with the hops because it just chewed through everything just that fast. So I dry hopped using the collection jar on my Firmzilla, uh, which is actually a pretty fun way to do it without really introducing too much oxygen to the beer when you're dry hopping it. So as long as the butterfly valve on the fermenter is closed, you can actually take that jar right off and uh, you can put your hops in there, screw it back on, and then you can purge it with CO2 to make sure there's no oxygen there. You do that a couple times and it gets rid of the oxygen. And then if you pressurize that small container to a significantly higher pressure than the rest of the fermenter, the difference in pressure is actually gonna equalize out once you open that butterfly valve. The high pressure from the bottom wants to escape and expand, so it pulls the hops out of that collection jar and up into the beer, which is what happened. So it worked out pretty well. Um, also, one thing to note is that uh, when I was dry hopping, I did three or four days, I think, and that's about the maximum you really want to dry hop um, if you're not doing the biotransformation style because with higher amounts of uh, hop material in the dry hop at the end of fermentation you can start to get some very grassy flavors which are not always pleasant um, so that's usually especially when you're coming up on higher amounts of hops like four to eight ounce dry hops you really want to keep that down to like two to three days um, because it starts to really impact the flavor of your beer otherwise. But you can sort of get away with longer periods of time if you're using a lower quantity of hops. Um, I've done two ounce dry hops for like eight to 10 days and those have been fine. They haven't turned out really grassy, but then again, you're gonna get more hop aroma and more punch out of a larger amount of high alpha hops, obviously. But anyway, enough of me rambling. This is a pretty good beer, so we're gonna go ahead and pour it. All right, so it is called Wicked Crispy and it is 6.3% uh, ABV, about 68 IBUs.
Now, I called this one Wicked Crispy because there's just... It's a funny story associated with that. So one time last year when I was uh, out at this bar in, in suburban Boston area, um, I was sitting at the bar, I was ordering a drink, and uh, <laughs> some some woman and her friend come up. And I, they're obviously locals, they know the bartender, I was chatting with the bartender, and they got the most thick Boston accents out there. And so anyway, this woman goes and tells the bartender, she, she orders a drink, and then she orders fries. Now, I don't really do a great Boston accent because I'm not actually originally from the area, but uh, it essentially went something like this. Hey, Joe, tell him in the back there to throw the fries in there twice so they're wicked crispy, all right? So, ever since then, Wicked Crispy has kind of become an inside joke for me and my girlfriend, uh, who are at the bar together, so, um... Anyway, this is a Wicked Crispy beer, and that is why it has that name. Alright, so I'm sorry if there's any additional noise right now because my neighborhood's very active right now, um, but I had to get outside and make use of the remaining light that we have to review this. And I'm hoping it's worth it. I also had to um, make some last minute adjustments because my lav mic mysteriously broke uh, in between the last clip and this one. So that's unfortunate. And I have to go to my backup mic, which is um, unfortunately not as good of a uh, noise threshold as a lav mic. But uh, hopefully we can work with that. All right. So for the appearance of the beer, it's totally clear. Uh, looks like it's a nice dark gold, maybe very, very light amber color. Uh, and... Uh, you know, really, really very clear and uh, a nice white fluffy head on top. I have good head retention on this beer and good lacing and I'm very happy to report that. So I, as you can see, the clarifying process on the beer worked out really, really well. Um, so I ended up basically just giving this a good treatment with gelatin as I kegged it. And then um, basically I have a floating dip tube system in that keg, which allows me to draw beer from the very top, which is the clearest beer, as the rest of the sediment falls towards the bottom gradually over the course of lagering or cold storage. So now we're gonna move on towards aroma. So it's actually very clean. There's no yeast esters because, well, this was a lager yeast that fermented basically clean as a whistle. So there's no sort of fruity notes on, on from the yeast. It's a nice um, piney citrus bit in there. Um, and you can kind of get some of the grain coming through as well. Uh, now we'll go in towards mouthfeel. Very, very dry. Very dry, very light, very pleasant. It's um, it's actually it's got a very, very light body mouthfeel. Um, nothing, you know, really making it very heavy or thick or um, even anything towards the medium side. There's, It's a very light, crispy, dry mouthfeel. Which, you know, harkening back to the whole West Coast style of this, uh, is the way that it should be. Alright, so now we're going to go ahead and make use of what daylight is remaining uh, to go ahead and talk about flavor and end this video. It's good. It's pretty good. It's, um, it's really just full of clean, crisp hop flavor. Um, and I, I think it does really kind of remind me of, of a good West Coast IPA, even though it's not technically an IPA, it's an IPL. Yeah, key difference here between the IPA is the fact that it is clean, dry, light bodied, and just in general, exceptionally like squeaky clean. Um, there's not a single bit of yeast ester in this. In fact, like I, I'm trying to find something. There's no sulfur. There is no um, fruitiness. There is no alcohol presence. It's just clean. Um, and I love that. What that does is it really allows a background for nothing but the hops and the malt to really shine and not be obscured by anything the yeast produces. Uh, like I said, this is kind of reminiscent of a West Coast style and, you know, back on to IPAs, I guess. I do think that the West Coast style is probably the superior IPA and that might be fighting words for some people, but uh, it is cleaner, it's crisper, it's easier to drink, and I think it's just more interesting than a New England IPA. I think a lot of New England IPAs just end up tasting the same. Um, if I had the choice between drinking only one of them for the rest of my entire life, I would probably choose the West Coast IPA without failure. Um, and that's just me. You know, that's my personal taste. Everyone has a different one. But this is very, very West Coast-esque. Uh, and I love that. Um, the hops that are coming through are extremely... Uh, grapefruit heavy. Uh, there is a very, very clean bitterness on this, by the way. There is, it, it's not sharp, it's not acrid, it's not objectively offensive. It's just perfect for what you would expect out of a moderately hopped IPA slash IPL. The flavor of it is predominantly grapefruit. Um, there's grapefruit, there's a dankness to this. 
um, kind of an earthy note as well as a significant amount of pine and resin um, and it's just gorgeous I think predominantly you get the most um, out of grapefruit and dankness uh, but it just screams West Coast perfect as you can see, it's extremely drinkable beer, and I just keep taking sips of it. <laughs> but I love this. I love this beer. Um, it's probably one of my favorite hot forward beers I've made in a while. And um, I'm also pleased to, re to report that there is no grassy flavor in this either. So uh, I did not over dry hop it. If anything, I think I could have improved by adding a little additional uh, time or temperature increase in the whirlpool to get a little bit more of that nice hop flavor out of it. I wouldn't say that it's lacking, but I would say that it probably could use more. Um, and, and, you know, despite having 68 IBUs, it doesn't necessarily seem to uh, really have as much flavor as I was expecting. This could be the fact that I just have such a tolerance for hops now that it just don't pick up on it, <laughs> which would be unfortunate. As far as the malt goes, and this is really one of the, my favorite aspects about this beer, the malt character of this beer is really interesting. Um, so in addition to having a clean, crisp hop character, this also has a very bright and interesting malt profile, which makes the beer more interesting, which is what I'm getting at. Definitely something that comes out at the end, uh, so you get your hops first, they kind of fade, and then you end up where you're left with a residual malt flavor, which is really crackery and cereally and grainy uh, it's really nice there's no sweetness to it you know it's not like a honey type of flavor um, there's no real breadiness to it it's just very clean grainy crackery um, just awesome it's awesome there's no there's no additional sweetness and I think that's important in a bitter beer like this um, and I also gave it a gorgeous color I mean this is definitely a really nicely balanced dark gold color uh, that I, I think is quite pretty in the glass, especially when it's totally clear. Very similar to like a, a dark hell is lager, maybe. Um, so I'm very proud of it. So, as you can see, very, very drinkable. Very huge success. Very easy to make. If you, uh, even if you don't have a firm Zilla, this is definitely an exceptionally easy hoppy beer to make. Um, I do think it is kind of important to pay attention to that water profile, though, and to make sure you get a, a decent amount of... Uh, sulfate to chloride ratio there. Um, at the same time, there's a lot of minerals in this water profile, and the minerals are not coming through in this flavor, uh, which I'm really happy to report as well. So <laughs> sometimes that can happen, with a, especially with the hoppy beers. You can get a little bit of a metallic taste or a minerally taste, and it's not pleasant. So yeah, as far as things that I really would improve upon, I'd say probably just adding a little bit more of that Whirlpool edition, and um, that's it. There's really nothing else I can say about this beer that's different. I love the hop combination. I love the malt presence. I love the hopping rate. And I think that uh, the only thing that really could be to stand to be improved is a little bit more hop flavor, and that is it. I'm very, very pleased with the way this went. This should be a great beer to have on tap for a couple weeks. Um, I'm gonna try and finish it quickly to keep those hops fresh and bright. So I am gonna probably be taking a momentary pause uh, in brewing and creating videos for a little while. Uh, I have been doing it at roughly the tempo of every two to three weeks, and it has been a lot of fun, but it's also eating up a lot of my personal time. And right now, I found it kind of hard to maintain a balance between work and fun and this. So I'm going to be taking a little bit of a break. Um, don't worry, I will very much be coming back. There is a uh, pumpkin beer that is making its way to the channel later on. Um, but I just want to let you guys know, if you don't hear from me, um, you don't see anything pop up on the channel for a while, everything is fine. I'm just taking a short hiatus. Um, and just kind of need to do that right now. And uh, I will be back later on this year. That being said, I still have plenty of other social media platforms that uh, require a significant amount less effort than YouTube uh, to maintain, so you can still see me active on those during this little break, and that would be my Instagram, which is at the Apartment Brewer on Instagram, as well as my Patreon page, which is a great way, by the way, if you want to support the channel financially, um, it is a great way to do that. On the Patreon page, there's a series of goals that I've thrown together that would uh, really help this channel grow quite significantly faster. Uh, and I need your help for that. Some of those things are things like increasing the quality of the videos via better filming equipment and mm, better audio equipment. Things that are uh, probably important. If you want to check out the page, I'll leave a link at the end of this video as well as in the description and in a card notification here uh, where you can also see a video on that page where I explain just what I'm trying to accomplish with that. So hey, if you liked the video, if you learned something, if you found this useful, please hit that like button. Let me know. Comment down below if you want to talk any about the beer in any way. Uh, you want to talk about the recipe, you want to talk about brewing, just whatever. Hit me up. I read all those comments and I do my best to respond to as many of them as I can in a timely manner. 
Uh, if you enjoy seeing this stuff on the regular, please hit the subscribe button as well. Um, I do stick to a relatively consistent timeline of about every two to three weeks kicking out a brand new grain of glass video. So please subscribe for more of that content. But if you want more frequent updates, there's Instagram, there's also Patreon. If you're interested in buying any of the equipment that I use in this video, do include the Firmzilla. Uh, there is a whole list of links down in the description box below the recipe where you can check out uh, all of that stuff if you wish to. In the meantime, I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.